I must admit, I have lectured at Cambridge and at universities from Harvard to uh, Western Illinois, but I've rarely been more nervous than I am this day. I'm astonished um, that you would invite me, Benjamin Dan Walsh, to speak as a part of this series celebrating the history of Bishop Hill. For if you have read some of my letters, then you know I have love, no love lost for the Swedish utopian experiment. I was here before there was a Bishop Hill. I was here before there was a Cambridge. And maybe you also know that I wrote the letter to my good friend, the governor, that uh, sought executive clemency for John Root, who murdered Eric Jansen. And I'll tell you more about that later. I was thinking that I might begin with a little bit of my story and my life in England and why I immigrated and why I came to Henry County. I'll share with you some of my stories here on the Western Frontier and my researches that led to the publication of American Entomology, a magazine that I founded and is still in print. Um, of course, my letters with Charles Darwin, one of my good friends. Maybe you've read his work on the origin of species. In the fifth and sixth edition, he quotes research that I did here in the prairies and forests of Illinois. But uh, near the end, I promise I will tell you my unvarnished views of this uh, Swedish utopian experiment. Well, <clears throat> beginning with the beginning. I was born in 1808 from a rather large family. My mother bore 13 children and I was the fifth. My father was a member of the House of Commons in Parliament. He served, but uh, he met a rather unhappy ending. He was caught quite literally red-handed, uh, stealing money from the National Lottery. His embezzlement uh, meant that he tried to flee the country, and he was captured at the harbor as he was trying to sail to America with his mistress, not my mother or his family. And he rotted in prison and eventually in hell. And he left his family impoverished. Now, you in America, I, I, I'm always intrigued that you have no class consciousness. <laughs> Clearly, you have classes. You have the wealthy, the elite, and those who are working class, and those that are impoverished. But you pretend that anyone could gain great heights. And yes, I voted for Abraham Lincoln, born in a log cabin. And Lincoln said that if he could eventually inhabit the White House, then there is hope for every farmer's child. But in England, it is all about what class you inhabit. And with our impoverishment, we fell precipitously into the lower classes. It was only because my father had a few good friends, even though he was not friends to them, they looked after us. And because of the high marks that I received at St. Mark's Academy, I was accepted into Cambridge. Now, at Cambridge, I was not a member of the upper class. I, I was enrolled as a sizar, a word you probably do not know. It meant that I did laundry for the other upperclassmen. I helped them with their homework. They treated me worse than I would treat a dog. But I proved myself a scholar. And I not only earned the highest marks, but because of my gift in tutoring my friends, I refused to do their homework for them as they expected. I would ask them hard questions and they would learn and they scored well. And so I was invited to be a fellow, a professor at Cambridge, unheard of for a sizar to be offered tenure as a professor. It was while I was a student there at Cambridge that I met my good friend, 
uh, Charles Darwin, Esquire. I remember one day we were out in the heath collecting insects. We both have had a lifelong love affair with those little winged creatures. He saw a beetle he had never seen before, and he snatched it up in one hand. And in the same moment, he spied a second variety of beetle, and so he snatched it up in his other hand. And crawling out from under the bark of a decrepit tree stump, he saw yet a third variety of beetle. Three beetles, two hands. What would you do? Anyone? He popped it in his mouth. Give this gentleman a round of applause. That's exactly right. Now, if you were such a beetle in his mouth, what would you do? It squirted an acrid, acidic fluid hotter than any habanero pepper. If you had such a beetle in your mouth, what would you do? You'd do exactly what the beetle wished you would do. And he spat it from his mouth and and, and the, the third one escaped as well. But how could it be that there were three varieties of beetles here in this one place? All of them clearly insects with hard, shiny exoskeleton and six legs. One had small pinchers for eating leaves and herbivore. The other had a proboscis, a snout for sucking sap. It was a parasite. And the third had large pinchers for eating other beetles, a carnivore. What had each of them inherited from their ancestors? Over time, how had the three of them adapted to changes in their food supply and changes in the environment? How had nature selected these to survive, whereas other species of beetle have become extinct? And there, in that one short story, you have the core of Darwin's theory. Through individual variation, Over great amounts of time, species inherit certain traits that nature selects. And through that adaptation, they not only survive, they thrive, and their offspring inherit those same traits. If you think about Charles Darwin's point of view as his vista, variation, inheritance, natural selection, over time, allows adaptation vista, to give rise to new species. As Darwin once wrote in a letter to me, he said, no poet was ever as proud to see his poem published as he was, to see one of his beetles published in Stephen's Coleopterus of England. Well, Darwin and I shared that love for beetles, but when I received tenure, I was a a classics professor. A theologian, I taught religion and philosophy, and, uh, and I translated Virgil into English for the first time using English meter. So replicating not just the words, but also the rhythm and the poetry of Virgil. But as a member of the lower class, I saw how higher education was virtually inaccessible to the working classes. And so after 13 years as a tenured professor, Much like Martin Luther at Worms, I quit the Church of Higher Education. And much like Martin Luther at Worms, I issued an edict. 36 things that needed to change to make higher education more accessible to the working classes. And much like Martin Luther at Worms, I nailed my edict to the door of my office and I quit. And I came to America. I was astonished to hear that within a year, Cambridge adopted all 36 of my suggestions. They saw the truth of it. Magna es veritas, et veritas prevailabit. Great is the truth, and the truth shall prevail. So let me ask all of you a question. How many of you had the great good fortune to attend college or university? And how many of you are from the working classes? You can thank my edict. And more important, thank Cambridge. Because most American universities were modeled after the great universities of England. And when Cambridge made university accessible to the working classes, so did the American universities. You should also thank Thomas Jefferson. Can you say thank you, Thomas Jefferson? (laughs) 
because of the agricultural institutions that he established. When he laid out the Northwest Ordinance, making uh, the door open for Ohio, Indiana, Illinois, Wisconsin, and Michigan to join these United States, he hired a team of surveyors to measure one-mile plats. And he set one of those plats aside in every district to build a university. How many of you attended one of those universities? He was a genius. Because he knew that education is what will enliven our democracy. If through education we can ask difficult questions and hold civil debate, then our democracy, our democracy shall thrive. That is why I came to America. In 1838, I thought that first I would settle in Chicago, but even at that early date, Chicago was too large and uh, it had nearly 348 citizens. <laughs> so I moved to what was then the Western Wilderness, Henry County. There was no Cambridge, there was no Bishop Hill. I was a gentleman farmer. I owned nearly 300 acres but the nearest manufacturer, the nearest village, was 20 or 30 miles away. And so when I needed a new hogshead for my barrel, I need to make it myself. I need to make the barrel and cut the staves. I even learned a little bit of blacksmithing to make the hoops so I could ship my goods to market. And I hope to live the life of the gentleman farmer, studying the insects, the flora and the fauna of Henry County. I began to send letters to my dear friend, Charles Darwin. I even shipped him a box of the 13-year uh, cicada. Didn't they just recently hatch? Have you seen them? We pondered whether or not the fact that they, they hatched, they were 13 and 17-year cicadas. Uh, does this mean that they are different species? Because they never have a chance to interbreed. And if you look closely at the breeding apparatus, sexual selection was part of Darwin's theory then you can see that indeed they are a unique species. Every 13-year cicada eventually over time adapts and only breeds with itself, and so they separate themselves as different species from the 17-year cicadas. Have you eaten them? <laughs> they are quite tasty if you fry them in butter. <laughs> I saw all of the bird life and all of the mammals and, and the reptiles and amphibians feasting on cicadas. And so I, of course, had to try them. And I thought I would live the rest of my days here in Henry County until the Swedes arrived. <laughs> now, when they first came, I was amazed that... Uh, they bought just a few dozen acres, but there were several hundred of them. And how were they to survive? Knowing that they arrived so late in the year that it was too late to plant a crop, how were they going to feed themselves? There was no market economy. Most of the farmers here in the western wilderness, we had no way to ship our farm goods to market. And so it was strictly sustainable agriculture. That first winter, they starved. And Eric Jansen began to preach first fasting. Didn't Moses fast when he went to the mountain, then Jesus in the desert? Uh, of course you fast if you have no food. <laughs> And then he began to preach celibacy. They could not feed themselves, let alone bring children into the world. Though I will tell you, at that point, several dozen abandoned the community and headed to Chicago. They did not sign on for celibacy. <laughs> and we jest now, but that first winter was indeed very hard for them. Nearly a hundred starved. And whether it was starvation that killed them or weakened them, disease claimed the rest. And eventually they bought several thousand acres, including much of the property surrounding mine. And when they put a dam on the Edwards River, 
Maybe you've seen the Olaf Kranz painting. It was not a man-made dam, it was women doing the work. For I believe women outnumbered the men. And the women were pile drivers, pulling the rope uh, the, that uh, lifted the huge log that drove the other log in. And I knew that that might spell their doom. I wrote in a letter to Charles Darwin that they have created a miasmic cesspool of infectious insects. And it wasn't long before my prophecy proved correct. I contracted a malaria-like disease that nearly claimed my life. I was so weakened. And it killed nearly a hundred of them. When cholera swept through the community, I sold my farm and I moved to Rock Island. I knew that in Rock Island, I would be away from that miasmic cesspool of infectious insects. And I sold my farm, and in the end, I was only a thousand dollars poorer. I lost money in the account because the Swedes had purchased so much property around me that the property was undervalued. And of course, it was acquired eventually by them. But I understand that recently, Wilbur Nelson has bought that property. And actually, I was talking to him just before the program. Um, it seems that the house that I built in 1838 has recently fallen in and was, I believe, burned eventually. And I'm sure that Wilbur harvests more crops and, and garnishes a greater income from the rich soils than he would from this abandoned home that no longer stands. It's just a, a little north of here, if you wish to visit my homestead. Well, in Rock Island, I did better. I took what I uh, uh, appreciated from the sale of my home and I invested in the timber industry. And you might know that Rock Island at the time, because of the mills um, that stood on the backside of the island, a lot of lumber was processed. I built a lumber yard and built a small fortune. Within about eight years, I was able to sell the, yum, the lumber yard at a great profit and I built 10 row houses. And I decided that simply renting out the row houses as a, a tenement, I could generate enough annual income to pursue my real passion, entomology. And I began to publish scientific papers, both in England, in Boston and Philadelphia. And I, I gained the attention of scientists around the world. I was the first to write practical papers. I even founded a magazine called Practical Entomology, which eventually dissolved and became the American entomologist. Helping farmers to appreciate that the identification of insects could help them. And also debunking the great myths of the chemical salesmen. For you know the Paris green that is sprinkled on the crops to kill insects will kill you as well. And many a farmer was poisoned with these chemicals. You know, uh, pesticide, the root uh, side, uh, it's like homicide and suicide and genocide. Uh, Paris green in particular is arsenic in a copper sulfate base. And if the wind is blowing when you sprinkle it on your plants and you inhale just a slight amount, it bioaccumulates over time and poisons your liver and is a wicked way to die. Uh, there was best uh, invigorator. That's how he sold it. He had several patents, and one farmer wrote, and we published his reports, that uh, it is very effective at killing the potato bugs because it kills the potato vines. And when the plants are dead, then the bugs starve to death. But if you study the insects and you learn something about their life cycles, then there are more natural ways to diminish the pestilence that insects might provide. For example, if you let your hogs loose to feed in your orchards towards the end of the season, you're not only fattening your hogs, but your hogs will eat the rotting plums and prunes and apples and therefore devour the larva of insects, diminishing the maggots you'll have next season. If you know what specific midget is living in the stalks of your grains, 
when the midge weakens that stalk and a storm blows it over, harvest what you can, but then burn the stubble and you'll kill the lava and you won't have the same problem next season. If you have grasshoppers and other kinds of leaf eaters in your grapevines, go out at this time of year. That small prairie right there, I've seen them. Collect the egg cases of the praying mantis and bring those egg cases into your gardens and your orchards and the praying mantis will take care of those leaf eaters. And by doing the research, learning to identify insects and learning to work within the cycles of nature, we can reduce the economic impact. And maybe it was that last phrase, the economic impact, that garnished my work some attention. At first they said, what is the point of the natural history? Actually, if you'll indulge me, here's a letter we received from one of our subscribers in Canada. As much as we could, we published the writing of our readers to encourage everyone to be a citizen scientist because your observations are as valuable as anybody's once you learn what you are looking for and what you are looking at. There was this uh, farmer in Canada who, 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 who shared this letter. We lately met a friend who, thinking that it was necessary to apologize to us for not having subscribed to your journal, told us that he had paid no attention whatsoever to natural history. I care but very little, he added, to know whether a butterfly has a yellow tail or a red one, and I willingly let that question alone without troubling my head about it. It is fortunate, we replied, that there are other people who do not think as you do, for the thing of it is more important than you might suppose. If all the world had reasoned as you do, then steam, electricity, magnetism would have never received from man those practical applications which astonish us and the intellect of today and constitute the wonder of our time. A butterfly's tail, being yellow or red, contains nothing which ought uh, intrinsically to interest us. But if that character, one is enabled to distinguish whether that butterfly is friend or foe, a beneficial being or a dangerous animal capable of causing considerable economic damage, then this character acquires a very special importance. And you ought to think yourself fortunate, we added that others have done for you what you do not feel the courage to undertake for yourself and have given you the power by means of such publications as ours to jump to results without having been subjected to the toilsome labor or the demonstration, that is to say, to draw your interest without having deposited any capital to the great bank of science. Again, I ask, how many of you have had the great good fortune to attend one of the community colleges or agricultural institutions? It is because we are training the farmers to think like a scientist, to pay attention to their crops, that we are able to diminish the impact of insects, not just on the economics of their harvest, but on the overall health and the quality and the quantity of food which they are to grow. Uh, if you'll indulge me, one of my specialties was WASP. And I was the first to publish a series of articles that were the first to de delineate the great varieties of WASP. And uh, one of my favorite, uh, here it is. Uh, actually, before I get to WASP, Here's another article we received from one of our readers about butterflies. He had said, We must look in order to see, and in natural history perhaps, more than any other department of knowledge, we must know how to look in order not to be deceived in our observations. One day, one of our worthy neighbors came to call upon us a very, with a self-satisfied air. He said that I have found an insect that... I promise you have never seen before. It is a butterfly with six wings. 
Now, I had an assumption of what he spoke of, but I did not want to burst his bubbles. And so I insisted that he share with me this butterfly with six wings. He said it was, it was large, like, uh, like a church mouse. And its wings were, were dark brown with bits of amber and gold. And on the hind wings, it had what appeared to be an owl's eyes, which confirmed my hypothesis. But wanting to encourage his inquisitiveness and his ability to not just look, but to know what he was looking at, I followed him to his abode. And what he showed me was the most amazing thing. As we approached, I said, you know, moths and butterflies are travelers. And much like a, a ship will have its top sail and its main sail, sometimes a ship will have a jib to help it steer more accurately. And so maybe your butterfly has a little jib sail on its head. We both laughed at the, at the metaphor. And when I arrived, I, he showed me the most beautiful Cecropia moth. Have you seen them? Unlike a butterfly, which has a long, narrow antenna, the largest of the Cecropia moths has a very wide, triangular-shaped antenna, which, by the untrained eye, could be judged as a set of little jib sails upon its head. He laughed at his own mistake, and I will admit, as every scientist should, that we are all capable of such mistakes. And a good scientist is willing to admit their fallibility and therefore learn from their mistakes. Magna est veritas, et veritas prevail a bit. Great is the truth, and the truth shall prevail. One last story about my correspondence with Charles Darwin. When he first sent me his book, I have to admit I was hesitant because I had heard the controversy, it preceded him. And um, I was ready to doubt and disbelieve. But the first time I read it, I was completely astonished at both the clarity of his thinking and the irrefutable evidence that he provided. The second time I read it, I became a convert. And the third time, I became an advocate, much like Thomas Huxley in England, who's quoted as saying, I am sharpening tooth and claw in your defense. Thomas Huxley founded what was affectionately known as Darwin's Bulldogs. Because Darwin refused to argue. He let the truth stand on its own. And so I became America's first Darwin's Bulldog. A great professor at uh, Harvard, Louis Agassiz, had published much on ichthyology, the fishes of America, and his work on glaciers, and especially the glaciation of Illinois, was genius. The depth of his observations. But he was what some would call a creationist, and believed irrefutably that God's hand was involved in the creation of every species. As Darwin asked, let me ask you, consider every creature upon the earth today. Have they all been here since the dawn of time? Or is there geological evidence that some have become extinct and others have arisen from the old? And if you believe as I do, what is the mechanism which allows new species to adapt to their environment? We've seen recently, when we spray the agricultural fields with certain chemicals, that it will kill most of the insects, but some will survive, and they'll develop resiliency over time. Louis Agassi was a great intellect, but incapable of holding in his mind two ideas at the same time. Is it possible that both God made the earth made the world, and evolution is a mechanical process of how new species arise. We became famous in our public debates. Agassi even came to Rock Island and lectured at the university there, and I met him as a friend and colleague and engaged in debate. But the real reason we are here 
is to hear more about my opinion of Bishop Hill and its founders. And so let me get to that, that letter. Before I read the letter to you, I, I will say that, uh, as I mentioned moments ago, I, I was intrigued that nearly a thousand came, and yet they had only purchased a couple of dozen acres. I was quite pleased at first to see the community grow as shipload after shipload arrived. They fled the religious tyranny of the Lutheran church. And you might know that the king of Sweden was very much in bed with the Lutheran church. You could be fined if you did not tithe the church. It was not an option, it was a tax. If you did not pray as they did, if you did not attend church, you could be persecuted. They persecuted Eric Jansen just enough to annoy him, but not enough to stop him. And his followers grew. When they first arrived, they began to buy the property around those dozen acres. And soon it grew to more than 14,000 acres, I believe square miles in total and they built the industry that you see around you to think that young women and girls harvested the clay in a ditch along the Edwards River and with their own hands formed each one of the stones you see here of course I will mention that they learned stone uh, brick making from an English immigrant and I think it might have been a German immigrant that helped them to build the kilns. I might have reversed those stories, I'm not sure. But think about the millions of bricks that they made in this town. They sent a few as emissaries um, to the Shaker communities. And at Pleasant Plains they learned to make brooms. And they grew thousands of acres of broom corn. And they were great agriculturalists. They went from impoverishment to an abundance, not only enough to feed the, the thousands that came, but enough to have an access to sell to the market. Literally miles of rugs and miles of linen and thousands of brooms. Matter of fact, the brick had deserved a, a well-earned a well reputation. So if you go to Galena, Illinois, the jailhouse is built with brick from Bishop Hill because the sheriff in Galena had once been a sheriff here in, in Henry County and he knew the quality of the brick and the trains had come through so it was easier to move the brick at that point. But when uh, John Root mur murdered Eric Jansen and then was imprisoned for that act. I had just recently been selected the Illinois State Entomologist. I had been through congressional approval. It took more than a year because my nomination from the horticultural department, being the first state entomologist in Illinois and only the second state entomologist in the nation, took some time and it was tied to other political appointments. But in that process, I got to know some of the congressmen, uh, one who became our governor, Governor Joel Madison. I, I, I'm hesitant because I'm reluctant to read this letter to you. You may not agree. But remember, I do have a degree in theology. And as an Englishman, I know that the American laws... The American jurisprudence is based very much on English law. And so, as a scholar of the classics, one capable of rhetoric, here are my arguments. You decide for yourself whether or not you would agree. And then we can discuss or debate when I am through. I do hope to field a few questions. To His Excellency Joel A. Madison, Governor of the State of Illinois, from Rock Island, January 2nd, 1854. Dear Sir, 
I lived in the immediate neighborhood of the Swedish colony in Henry County at the time when their prophet Jansen was killed by John Root. Having some knowledge of the Swedish language and mining a good deal of time at, amongst their leading men, I suppose I know as much as anyone who is not a party of concern of the antecedents of the case. I have ventured, therefore, to state a few facts to which you may perhaps throw some little light upon the nature of the transaction. Mr. Marcus B. Osborne has promised to attend a few lines to this communication, which will advise you to what degree of credit shall be attached to my statements. Eric Jansen was originally a small farmer in Sweden with just enough education to read the Bible. In Sweden, no other religion but the Lutheran is tolerated. And consequently, when Jansen commenced preaching certain new light documents and doctrines of his own, he was persecuted, just enough to irritate him, but not enough to put him or his followers down. Finally, he took the very wise resolution of immigrating to these United States and founding a colony. As to the nature of his doctrine, there is very little peculiar about them except that he claimed to be some kind of incarnation of Jesus Christ with the power of prophecy and working miracles. And that he adopted to its fullest extent the theory of the community of goods that all things should be held in common. When a man enters a society, he throws everything into the common stock. But when he leaves, he is not allowed to take back what he has thrown in. There is, however, one dangerous principle which runs through all of Jansen's writings. He draws a broad distinction between believers, by which he means the members of his own sect, and unbelievers, in Swedish, deastrogna, or the infidels. The former, he intimates, bear the same relation towards the latter that the Jews bore towards the heathens. And two very different rules of morality are laid down as applicable to the two cases. In support of the distinction, he quotes all of the abominations throughout time, and they are the perpetrators. In reference to John Root, where was his remedy? Bring the case home to yourself. Suppose that you had a Roman Catholic wife and an only child, and were by your political acts to make yourself obnoxious to the Roman Catholic bishop. Suppose thereupon this bishop were by force means to get your wife and child into his custody and by the powerful combination of his co-religionist were to succeed in keeping them hid so that while you lived you shall never more set eyes upon your wife or child. Would your conscience accuse you if you acted as Root acted? I might state as an additional reason for the pardoning of Root that his wife has now obtained a divorce from him. I shall only add in conclusion that I have been induced to move in this matter solely from the emotions of humanity. The almost universal feeling with educated men in this section of the country who are acquainted with the circumstances of the case that if they had been in Root's place, they should have acted as he acted, and that if justice had been the standard of his guilt, he would have never gone to the penitentiary at all. I have the honor to be, sir, your most obedient servant, Benjamin Dunn Walsh. And those additional lines from my friend, Marcus B. Osborne, he wrote on my letter, Dear Sir, I am well acquainted with Mr. Walsh, and I have the pleasure in stating that entire confidence may be placed in his statement of facts connected with the case of Root. These circumstances seem to me to palliate while they do not justify his violence. But taken in connection with his long imprisonment and failing health, 
make him, in my view, a suitable object for the exercise of executive clemency. With great respect, your obedient servant, Marcus B. Osborne. And there you have it, ladies and gentlemen. And with that, I close my case and I end my lecture. Thank you.